I am really honored to introduce T.L. Taylor for this um, academic keynote. I'm just going to read her bio and say a little about what her work means to me, and then we'll get straight into it. Um, T.L. Taylor is a professor of comparative media studies at MIT. She is a qualitative sociologist from Brandeis University in 2000 who has focused on internet and game studies for over two decades. Her research explores the interrelations between culture, social practice, and technology in online leisure environments. She is also the author of Play Between Worlds, Exploring Online Game Culture from MIT Press 2006, which used her multi-year ethnography of EverQuest to explore issues related to massively multiplayer online games. Her book, Raising the Stakes, Esports and the Professionalization of Computer Gaming, chronicles, chronicles the rise of esports and professional computer gaming. Ethnography in Virtual Worlds, A Handbook of Method, her co-authored book on doing ethnographic research in online multi-user worlds, was published by Princeton University Press. She's currently at work on a book about game live streaming, um, also from Princeton University Press. She also serves as director of research for AnyKey, an organization dedicated to supporting and developing fair and inclusive esports. It's a particular honor for me to introduce T.L. Taylor because she inspired me to be a video game scholar. Uh, Play Between Worlds had just come out when I was deciding what to do with my life after college, and it was one of the first books that helped me understand my experiences getting into being queer in online communities. So basically, I wouldn't be here without T.L. Taylor. <laughs> um, in today's talk, Play is Transformative Work, she explains the work of variety live streams on game streaming sites and talks about these streams as a new form of productive labor. Um, and I'll let you get into it. Thanks. <clears throat> Can you hear me okay? Is it on? Yeah? Uh, that was, thank you so much. That was. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> really, really amazing, thank you. Um, it's so great to be here. I wanna thank Bonnie, the whole crew, everybody involved in making this event happen, everybody who's doing stuff here on site to just make sure we all get into the right rooms and connected with each other. Um, I've followed this conference on Twitter for a few years now and always wanted to go and had it on my radar and so I'm really excited to get to, to be here this year. Um, so as mentioned, I'm going to talk to you mostly about my work uh, on live streaming, which is part of my current book. But I thought, you know, I, I, especially as game studies grows, I kind of never want to assume folks know you, know your work. So I have a couple slides to just tell you a little bit about my work, uh, kind of riffing on the bio that was just given. When I started um, doing game studies, it really came off of work I was doing on embodiment in virtual worlds back in the 90s. And I'm a qualitative sociologist, so as mentioned, um, I was really bored with my PhD by the time I was ready to finish it and started playing a game called EverQuest for fun and very quickly realized like, oh, this is an amazing field site. So ended up doing my first book, not on my dissertation. Um, there are pieces up there if you're interested in embodiment and virtual worlds from the 90s on my website, but my first book was on EverQuest and MMOs. And I've a little bit awkwardly put this tagline up here, games in a sociological frame, because part of what I was trying to do in that work was bring conversations we'd been having in sociology and cultural studies to the game studies field. And now I know this probably seems like, what, like of course, but <laughs> if you can imagine 16 years ago when formalists were spending a lot of time debating about games as text or games as systems, to come around and say maybe we should think about culture and the social and that was that was terrain that needed to be broken. So it's a little archaic now, but um, those are some of the themes I was working through in that book. And there are red threads. You'll probably, if you if you read that book, you'll probably see red threads from the talk I'm giving today. Um, <clears throat> the second book I did, second major work, was on esports, and that research ran from about 2003 to 2011. This was the period. Literally, I end that book going like, maybe it'll be a niche. <laughs> and then live streaming happened. Um, so that thread, uh, the book, the eSports book actually came because when I was doing the work in EverQuest, there was a type of player called a power gamer. We don't use that term much anymore, but it's min-maxers is what we often think of now. And they were fascinating to me because I was like, 
this is not at all how I play. They, for me, confounded ideas of work and play and leisure and instrumental play and the pleasures of instrumentality. So it's probably no surprise when I started hearing about professional gamers and esports way back then, I was really kind of my ears perked up. And so I started doing research on that book and I taglined this one, Games in a Sports Frame. Um, sociology is the con you know is through all of these but one of the things that in that work that work came up is you know the community was very invested in using sports as an anchor or as a rubric and so i took that seriously and tried to say well what if you know what if we riff on or look at sports sociology what if we look around conversations about masculinity and athletics and think about it in relation to geekdom and digital gaming so thinking about kind of how sports inflected that case in a lot of different ways. And so those are some of the themes. That book came out in 2012. As I mentioned, um, <coughs> literally, so the project I'm doing now, this book, I don't have a beautiful title yet. <laughs> Unfortunately, imagine something really cool there. Um, so this book that I'm finishing up now, I'm writing the conclusion, hopefully it'll be out in the next year or so. It really started as I was literally sitting, this was when I was living still in Sweden, I was sitting on my office sofa one night and I ended up watching the newly launched Twitch site, and they were showing a StarCraft II match from Paris in a theater they were broadcasting, and there were thousands of people watching. And I was like, oh, oh, this is interesting. Maybe I'll do an article to catch up my book's argument. <laughs> um, and I very quickly learned, much like all my projects, there's a lot more there than first meets the eye. And so, uh, since about since 2012, I've been interviewing. Most of the research is wrapped up now, but I've interviewed a range of broadcasters, esports and variety, platform developers, organizations, leagues, done site visits, spent a lot of time backstage at esports events, visited people in their homes to see their broadcasting setups, and then also spent a lot of time doing field work online, Twitch, you know, Reddit, uh, Twitter, uh, all, the, all the kind of usual multi-sided spaces that. An ethnographer like myself who's working with digital spaces finds you know, it's useful to think in a multi-sided way. So today, I'm going to talk about one small slice of this project, but I'm happy to field questions or have conversations at lunch. If you want to hear more about you know, the esports side of this book, I'm happy to do that. But today, I'm really just going to talk about one small slice. So um, how many people know what Twitch is? Yeah, good. <laughs> the pleasure is of presenting at games conferences, and of course we're being broadcast on it. So you probably all know what Twitch is. Um, I often think of it as a platform for making your otherwise private play public and for large audiences. So as you know, it lets you stream live your play to others. And one of the most important things that I'll talk more about is it gives broadcasters an opportunity to talk to their audience and make money off of it, which is also going to be an important part of my argument. So I'm going to focus today not on the esports side of things, though I'm happy to chat more about that if you like, but on those folks who are professionalizing play via other games. These are typically called variety streamers. When I first started the work, they were called social streamers, and I was so glad that language got ditched. It's like social games. It's the worst conceptual way of understanding this stuff. So they're now usually called variety streamers. And one of the things I've, most important things I've learned over the last several years is the tremendous amount of work they do to produce content. Uh, we certainly have seen this in the YouTube space for a long time, and I would just give a hat, hat, you know, hat tip to uh, Hector Postigo's work on people who are doing YouTube streaming. Uh, Esther McCallum Stewart has also done fantastic stuff. So I'm kind of taking some of these arguments and looking at it in the live space. So much of what we see from accomplished variety streamers is that they essentially become one person studios, television studios and that they labor to transform, as I said, their private play into public entertainment. This work weaves together some traditional media forms around entertainment and performance, very televisual in sense, um, but with new aspects around sociality, audience relations, and effective labor. So live streaming is offering this new group of people well beyond pro players a real, a real twist on the notion of what I call networked play and networked broadcast, a twist on network broadcast. These are everyday players imagining the potential to transform their private play into something for the broader public. Live streaming, I think, becomes an extension and perhaps re redefinition of sofa space 
and co-located play. Uh, while we can talk about the rise of this new medium, there's actually no single profile of a streamer. Broadcasters are actually a pretty heterogeneous bunch. Some stream for family and friends, some to create a sense of social connection, a kind of social imaginary. Some want to express fandom or expertise. Some are attempting to convert it into a professional identity. And in this project, I've spent most of my time looking at pe people who are aspiring to a professional identity. Um, and as I go on in this talk, you'll see why I think that's an important angle, because I think they raise the stakes on some broader cultural questions. Part of the work all of them are doing right now, though, is developing this genre, and it's evolving very quickly. And in fact, probably many of you have this experience. One of the pleasures and curses of researching internet or digital culture is it is often changing so quickly. Every time I'm ready to write this conclusion, something else happens. And uh, the, you know, uh, ethnographers, I guess, are good at being pragmatic. At some point, you just go, I'm done. I'm out. I got to write this thing and turn it in. So, and it becomes history very quickly, as with the eSports book. So for the remainder of the talk today, I want to use variety streaming as a way to talk about this new form of play and work arising in the space. And in particular, to start, I want to detail out a number of layers at work in productions to highlight how people are not simply taking games off the shelf and just playing them, but doing something fundamentally transformative with and through their play. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll you'll get a sense of what I think the stakes are in making the case for transformative play. So the first layer I think it's worth discussing when we look at live streams, and again, some of this may be pretty familiar to those of you, especially if, does anybody here do a regular live stream themselves? Yeah, okay, so the couple in the audience, you will probably go like, oh yes, I recognize all this labor. All right, so <clears throat> while the game itself makes up a portion of the viewer's screen, Accomplished screen streamers often use complex sets that involve additional audio, graphical overlays, green screening, cameras, triggered events, graphical and audio notifications of new followers, chatbots, custom chat emotes specific to the channel, even customized channel pages. It's worth noting that many of these components are produced not just by the live streamers themselves, but by an emerging third-party set of professionals whose expertise is in graphics and programming. So a number of the people I talk to contract out to people who have expertise in other domains to help them produce their cast. The set of any given live stream, and here I'm saying set, is often made up of a number of visual elements beyond the game itself and constructed through the labor of a number of people, at times distributed globally. Successful live streamers, though, don't just silently broadcast their gameplay. Instead, they tend to mix together what we typically understand as the think aloud method from usability testing, where the user speaks aloud their thought processes as they interact with the system and makes external that which would normally just be in their head, and various forms of humor, frustration, and suspense. And so I think of this as the performative layer, the performance layer. The frame of broadcast is typically one of trying to be entertaining and engaging, though what that's looked like has changed a lot over the years. And I think, uh, I, so I'm not a, formal media study scholar, I'm a sociologist, but if somebody was going to do genre analysis on Twitch and variety streaming, it would be fascinating because what counts as good content has also morphed and changed over the years. Streamers are often using physical expressions and gestures, at times theatrically accentuated, held for effect to accentuate their communication. And in fact, the number of people I've interviewed who are high-end professional live streamers who have a background in theater and performance is notable. Um, a number of us have argued over the years for understanding digital game as embodied action. This is really crucial. It's very easy to forget there are bodies at the screen. And live streaming is no exception. The body is actively deployed for engaging effect. And if you've ever watched one of these super over-the-top entertaining streamers, you probably have a sense of what that looks like in the most extreme. This is my little shout-out slide <laughs> to Tanya. Um, while a portion of the commentating live streamers do is rooted in actions they are undertaking, for many the analytic side is also a really important contribution to the work of play. So reflecting on mechanics, design, gameplay, feel, even political and cultural aspects and other angles can form a really important value for a stream. Astute streamers not only provide viewers with an entertaining performance of play, they also very often act as expert evaluators of systems 
conveying to their audience an independent analysis of the game as object. And those of you who have a foot in sort of cultural studies might think about their role as cultural intermediaries who are translating and doing work between a producer and an audience. I think actually one of the most crucial parts of live streaming performance is the one that is deeply interwoven, interwoven with audience and community engagement. Core to Twitch is the ongoing live chat that takes place alongside the visual broadcast of the streamer. Viewers of the channel not only talk to each other, but almost more importantly, talk to the streamer, and the streamer is typically replying audio, via audio, not in text. Accomplished streamers become adept at following their chat, talking to and engaging with viewers all the while playing the game. This interaction can range from welcoming newcomers to responding to questions or soliciting feedback. Um, one of the most interesting home visits I ever did, uh, it was fascinating to see a lot of accomplished live streamers have multiple monitors and they have the broadcast on one monitor, but the other monitor has an enlarged chat window. So they're constantly, it, it's an amazing skill to be multitasking in this way, watching what's happening in the chat, welcoming people, bringing them in. In many instances, the audience gets enlisted in the gameplay itself by giving input on choices within the game. In these moments, especially intense game scenarios, uh, are particularly entertaining and regularly generate high audience engagement. This is actually one of my favorite uh, streams that happened that uh, showed this. This was a stream with the broadcaster Sushi Sam, um, and she was playing The Walking Dead. And as she played and was hitting decision points, you know, her audience would weigh in on which of the branches to pursue. And it was a really wonderful performance, too, because you could see her talking through and with them different choices. And then, of course, when terrible things happened, as they often did, the kind of collective emotion around the experience that was happening in the game was really profound. The social and community layers of the production regularly extend beyond the live streaming platform, though, into other social media sites, such as Twitter, Facebook, even platforms like Steam that allow streamers to set up groups for their audiences. This is actually, a, I, I'm, I'm reading something that I wrote recently, and of course, within the last several weeks, those of you who are on Twitch a lot know that they've launched their communities. So now people are finding ways to have communities, and they have a whole new client as well. Discord, they have like a Discord replacement in the space. So this is a really important point about the way streamers extend their interaction beyond the moment of the stream itself and onto other platforms. A big component of this layer are the interrelations between audience and broadcaster, where significant connection and affective labor plays a significant role. Mixed in with promotional stuff is language about support, dreams, community, love, and passion. This is a very personal modality, one where the entertainer is often seen as a kind of friend and being in the channel is also tied to a, almost sometimes family language. So one of the streamers I interviewed said, the idea is that everybody who comes to my chat can recognize one another and becomes a community. So I interact with a lot of them. I talk to different people on the chat very frequently, and I lose games because of that. I mean, I'm not always focused on the game, since I focus a lot on talking to people in the chat. If people in the chat recognize one another, I think that adds an anchor to my stream that other streams don't have. So it's also not just the connection between audience and broadcaster, but how audiences, how spectators, how community members form relationships to each other. And time and again, when I talk to broadcasters, for them, a really pinnacle moment of success is when they feel like their community is engaging with each other and they could almost kind of recede slightly into the background. Um, what I'm describing here is, I think, not unlike the work, Nan uh, Nancy Bame's work on audience and musicians and how in the kind of new economic media sphere uh, musicians are having to live in, this kind of affective and connective labor is also having to happen on places like Twitter or Facebook. The next layer I want to flag is what I term the material and digital infrastructures. This is a screenshot of, if any of you know, man versus game. He posted this screenshot uh, on Twitter a while back. <clears throat> it's easy to forget how much of an infrastructure is at work when talking about internet platforms in general. And I think it's crucial to understanding the complexity at work in live streaming and indeed digital gaming more generally. This is embodied and material play and embodied and material work. 
Beyond the technical components provided by a platform like Twitch, at the individual streamer level, a range of material and digital components make popular streams possible. This includes computers, AV hardware, including mixing boards, furniture, lighting, sheets of green that get put up in the back for green screening. At the software level, it involves everything from graphics creation and AV processing software to bot and notification trigger systems to network functionality. Can't stream tonight. My internet connection is shit. <laughs> the level of technicity, something Dovey and Kennedy helpfully describe as particular kinds of attitudes, aptitudes, and skill with technology is involved in making more complex systems to these streams. This often involves a tremendous amount of self-taught expertise and community-based learning. One of my favorite uh, Twitch subreddit threads was people sharing wireframe mock-ups of how they had connected all of their components together. Many people I interviewed talk about experimenting with and piecing together systems. When looking at support communities for streamers, such as on Twitch, you'll see people sharing this kind of stuff. Details of how to make it work materially behind the scenes. The final layer I want to mention, especially for the purposes of this talk and argument, are the financial structures at work in accomplished live streams. So Twitch, and this is a little interstitial uh, that a popular broadcaster had for a while, so kind of in lieu of a commercial break. Uh, Twitch offers some broadcasters the opportunity to become a partner, which allows them to monetize in several ways. Ad revenue sharing through commercials, Bits, which is Twitch's own donation system after they realized donation systems were being handled by third parties and they could actually take a cut if they built the system. Monthly subscription options of which uh, streamers get a cut. A t-shirt production is also very important. Uh, beyond these formal mechanisms, many streamers also utilize donation systems and other third party um, uh, platforms to help support their financial development, sponsor deals, uh, Patreon, and Amazon affiliate links. So there's a tremendous amount of complex labor, both affective and otherwise, in navigating this slice in particular. And one of the most interesting things, talking to streamers and watching their practices, is seeing how they handle things like ad blocking, if they're going to roll in commercials. You know, they're thinking about the economic side, but also trying to make calculations. You know, if you're spending a lot of time building a rhetoric of community and family in your channel, what is the implication then if you start rolling out commercials? How do you balance that? Okay. Much of the kind of activity I've described so far has historically been framed as user-generated content and has been tied up with notions of non-commercial fandom, one where creative action gets framed primarily as an action of love or passionate fandom. That intervention over the last decade or so has been really helpful and important in helping people understand things like the rights they have under fair use. So the work organizations like Transformative Works that the organization from Transformative Works does has been really important. It's important people understand fair use claims in fan spaces. But I do worry that the non-commercialism that often um, drives some of the fandom UCG conversations perhaps sidesteps some broader, cr broader critical conversations about what it means for, as Rosemary Coombs puts it, she's done a fantastic book, if you haven't read it, called The Cultural Life of Intellectual Properties. It's amazing. Um, where she wants us to think about exactly that, the cultural lives of intellectual properties, what are there, and how may we, we may actually have some right to those properties. So in particular, as I said, the central trope of non-commercialism doesn't parse well to the dynamic of shifting private pleasures entering a public sphere, one often built very fundamentally on com commercialization, monetization, and professional aspirations. This is a screenshot, a uh, uh, screenshot. <laughs> this is a picture. <laughs> I, I can distinguish, I can distinguish. <laughs> um, of PAX East a few years ago, and I've been, for the last several years, I go to PAX East and I watched the Twitch booth. And its change and transformation over the years has been fantastic. And in the last several, they actually have places where, you know, really famous streamers set up shop, people come through, they get merch signed, they get to meet the people they subscribe to and are fans of. The desire to monetize their gaming that we see in some live streamers upturns, I think, the classic UGC conversation, where people are imagined to simply be fairly compliant com community members engaged in passionate but non-commercial fandom. 
It's also a model that I think doesn't fully work for play, which I want to argue is always something more than derivative and potentially infringing use of a software system. Play is always something more than derivative. I want to ask, how does the conversation shift if we start acknowledging that play is transformative? Now, I'm playing with this notion of transformation in a couple ways. One is evoking a more formal legal framing that asks, has the original work been transformed by adding new expression or meaning? Was value added by creating new information, new aesthetics, new insights and understandings? But I also am wanting to waypoint way back to arguments that games, and this is an argument that we've been building in game studies now for 15 plus years, that games are never simply taken as given artifacts, but exist in cultures and contexts where unexpected meanings and practices emerge. And those meanings and practices change what it is we're doing, change our understandings and engagement with the thing. In a moment, I think, where the field is really almost fetishizing games as procedural systems, it's important to remember that they are actually complex artifacts that involve circuits of human and non-human action, and they are co-created processes that often play exceeds its given bounds in a software product. One of my interviewees tapped into this key, I think, truth about gaming. When he likened his work in live streaming to that of a comedian or a musician who, while using the club's venue, still creates something that is theirs. Even though they're using that space, he said, the person who's up there performing, it's their act. That's theirs. So when I'm playing a game and I'm sitting there, I'm on stream, stream everything. And what is mine is anything, any content I create whenever I turn on my stream. That's my content. That is me. This is mine. Another developed this notion further when they said, so when you stream and you add any elements of customization, and now here be thinking about those layers I tried to sort of delineate earlier, um, beyond the game itself, when you start creating your own content, when you start adding humor, when you start doing different things, I think it takes it to a new level that is outside of the black or white of saying it's owned by the game creator. It becomes something of your own and it's part of the subculture of the internet as well. I think this taps into a much larger conceptual intervention, which is that play is always an assemblage. Something that I've argued before, there's an article up at my website if you want to read the arg argument, but it's made up of actors, processes, artifacts, meanings, policies, practices that are never contained by a single digital artifact. And I want to pause for a moment on this because as I said, contemporary game studies has evidenced this theme for at least the last 15 years. And if you lean on the work of amazing early anthropologists of play like Linda Hughes, we're talking decades that we've known this truth about playing games. Work of early critical and feminist scholars like Helen Kennedy, Mia Consalvo, Sal Humphreys, Marinka Coupier, Diane Carr, Celia Pierce, Seth Giddens, Hector Postigo, John Banks, Yeni Sundin, and many, many others have provided tremendous insight into the cultural and sociological work of play. My argument is standing alongside of those. As a side editorial note now, those of you coming to game studies in the last handful of years, please know there's a rich history of feminist game studies out there, ones that sync up, <laughs> ones that sync up really well with what I hear arguments being made in the current moment that can be leveraged in really powerful ways. So this is my little know your history game study scholars and know your feminist history game study scholars. Uh, in my own, I've seen the transformative elements from MMOs to esports. So whether that was modding or innovative social organization in MMOs or the way third parties radically reshaped the esports space, transformation is the red thread, the key red thread woven through the study of digital play. All right, now for a little bit of a, that was all the positive, wonderful stuff. <laughs> Alongside all of this creative work I've described is a tremendous amount of governance happening at a variety of levels. Something I call the regulation assemblage. I love the assemblage metaphor. I probably am overusing it, but I think it gets us somewhere still. When I explain live streaming to non-gaming audiences, I often address head on the question of if it's a free for all, and I suspect Many of you in this room will know the answer that 
no, it's not actually a free-for-all. It's a little bit. We're still in very early days and much is happening under the wire and handled ad hoc, but there is actually a complex set of regulations, which I've listed here, there's probably more we could add to that list, shaping things. And for the purposes of the argument now, I want to just say a few quick words about how forms of regulation are intervening in all of this potentially fantastic, cool, productive cultural activity I've described. So in the face of UGC, uh, platforms like Twitch and YouTube, game developers have issued a variety of statements. And those often turn on a couple of components, content regulation and non-commercialism. The language around uh, this stuff is usually about the risks of people engaging in prohibited content or action, the way it can hurt your monetization and your participation in the program. The guidelines are often formulated around sexuality, language, violence, drugs, harm, illegality, and increasingly, advertiser-friendly is a key rubric for what's allowed and what's deemed as permissible. On the content regulation front, from the earliest days, Twitch has taken, I would say, an at times strange stance on regulation. Uh, for example, when I first began looking at Twitch many, many years ago, I found a fascinating discussion on their forums, which is now closed, about Second Life. Somebody was asking, can Second Life be streamed? And the community manager, I'm just going to read this to you because it kind of makes me chuckle. The community manager said, Second Life is not itself a porn game, but a vast majority of the game u game's user-created user items are porn-related to an unavoidable degree. <laughs> the game does indeed have areas intended for teenagers or general non-adult related content, but these areas are the prime target for trolls and others alike to just post the worst of their porn-related collections. <laughs> there isn't really a safe spot you could stream in that game without the risk of accidentally showing something we would not approve of. Because of all of this, I think the safest bet is to not allow this game in general, just to keep people out of trouble. Now, while I've always gotten a good chuckle out of that, uh, uh, I think it did provide an early signal to Twitch's fraught relationship, fraught engagement with certain forms of embodiment, play, and themes. And I want to mention now, now two quick cases we've seen where this has come up in problematic ways more contemporarily. In October of 2014, Twitch released a revised rules of conduct that set off widespread coverage, heated discussion, and op-eds across a variety of sites. And this is what it said. Uh, Nerds, you're sexy, you're all magnificent, beautiful creatures, but let's try and keep this about the game, shall we? And then it went on to talk about the kind of clothing that should or shouldn't be worn on the streams. Meg Turney, a popular streamer at the time, tweeted out a message she'd received from a Twitch mod that day, informing her that an image in the profile panel of the site was deemed inappropriate and not suitable for Twitch in any capacity. That's the quote. And must be removed within a week or the channel would be suspended. This is the image in question. Now, numerous commentators, and indeed myself, found the policy problematic on several fronts. The first was in terms of the content that was regularly broadcast on the platform. So Daily Dot author M M uh, Ferguson Mitchell turned his attention to this disjuncture in several pieces, noting, originally noting that Twitch needed to, quote, acknowledge the obvious contradiction built into its new policy. The games themselves display a lot more sexually suggestive themes than most streams. Others saw the clothing policy as unfortunately spilling in to an ongoing set of attacks directed at women in game culture on the heels of Gamergate, which was during this period where the, the Code of Conduct was released. So you may recall, of course, social justice warriors were seen as interjecting too many political or feminist issues into game content and culture. Perhaps almost more powerfully was the way identity itself came to be an uneasy variable for so many of these reactionary stances. Over and over again, GGers said that it wasn't that they didn't want women, people of color, queer folks, and gaming, but they shouldn't be dragging their identities into it. Hmm. The refrain seemed to suggest that you, that you should just, just be a gamer, and it doesn't matter if you're a woman, or black, or gay. Anyone was welcome into game culture as long as they could fit into the forms of identity, embodiment, and engagement that already occupied it easily. 
the I think one of the awful things about this Twitch policy is it dovetailed with this. And it, in some ways, helped amplify and echo this idea that the policing, the regulation of particular forms, in this case, I think, of femininity in particular and embodiment was something that they were interested in doing. And it fueled what has still, even though this policy was quietly changed last year, um, it's, there's still com uh, problematic language around dress in the code of conducts. Um, but it fueled what has still come to be fights over what are sometimes called cleavage cams. And again, I think there's a lot we could say <laughs> and a lot that can be written about the regulation and policing of femininities in particular on the platform. Relatedly, I'd also note that Robert Yang's games have, in being banned from the platform, highlighted this aspect of Twitch's fraught policy decisions. Their policy currently states that, and I'm going to read it because it, as Yang points out, it is a strange and perplexive formulation. Nudity, pornography, sex, or sexual violence cannot be the core focus or feature of the game in question, and gameplay with modded nudity is entirely prohibited. Occurrences of in-game nudity are prohibited so long as you do not make them your primary focus of your content and only spend, and only spend as much time as needed in the area to progress the game story. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, games rated adults only AO by the ESRB are not permitted in content on Twitch. Now Yang has written, I think really insightfully, no other major video platform has this nonsensical, as long as it's not important, it's okay rule. Instead, <laughs> they usually emphasize context and the ethics of the nudity and sexual content. But I think both, of, both the dress policy and the, the way Yang's and, and other um, games themselves have been prohibited, suggests that Twitch has not quite figured out a non-problematic path through the kinds of content people want to put on the space. Now, while content regulation is just one domain in which production gets regulated, it's worth noting that there also remain foundational issues around intellectual property that in our current DMCA climate leave the work of live streamers incredibly precarious. Uh, it's a little bit of an esports example, but those of you who may have followed the Spectate Faker case, which was a really clever broadcaster taking an automated function of Riot's League of Legends game, automatically piping out whenever Faker, a very popular uh, esports player, was streaming, piping it out to Twitch and being hit with a cease and desist from another uh, Azubu, another uh, live streaming website. The layers of to put it quite, I mean, just to sort of put it simply, who owns the broadcast of the person? Is it Faker? Is it Faker's team who he's under contract with? Is it the game developer? Is it the platform itself? The layers of IP regulation and navigation, um, I think, are interesting and unfortunately tend to right now come down on the side of the game developer. As we know, IP regulation is increasingly embodied via technology where the use of software and computational techniques to enact DMCA provisions remains a constant tension point. This has had, I think those of you who are on YouTube or follow YouTube, it has had tremendous impact on YouTube. Um, there was actually just uh, two weeks ago uh, real problems around uh, uh, queer content getting filtered out and uh, tagged as for adults only, even though it should not have been. That was not automated, but the power platforms have to decide what gets through and what gets distributed is huge. So we saw automated content f wrongly flagging uh, things as infringing. There was a Hugo Awards instance and Michelle Obama's DNC speech was brought down because the system thought it was infringing. What we, ha we have right now then are content, our creative cultural producers, live streamers, doing tremendous work to transform their private play into paid public entertainment yet working within legal policy and technical models that don't funda fundamentally give them any rights. While live streaming poses challenges to automated content regulation, it's a tech challenge that's actively being tackled, and you now see audio, automatic audio regulation on Twitch. In the meantime, manual DMCA claims jump in, and as we've seen on other platforms, this has had profound effects on content distribution. So how are broadcasters navigating this legal thicket. I would say with trepidation and confusion for the most part. 
So some broadcasters are banking on building something so strong a company wouldn't dare mess with it. And so this is, a, I, many of you may know, Day Nine, longtime content producer. He gave a talk at MIT a number of years ago. I wasn't there. Todd was probably there. And this was one of the things he said. So I mean, let's say in five years, and there's like 15 million people watching the Day Nine Daily every night. Let's just say that's the circumstance. And then Blizzard realizes this and says, well, hey, we want to do a daily talk show on StarCraft II. We don't want some nerd doing it and they tried to cut me out, then all of a sudden there's going to be these 15 million people saying, you took our entertainment away. So this imagined power of the audience to speak back against a DMCA claim. The other major line you hear from broadcasters is that game companies must just see this as great PR for their games, and so that's why they let them continue to flourish and people watch. Watching streams can get people excited about games, bring them to the game scene and culture, help them find new games to buy. Um, this is actually, I think, an interesting empirical question, because I talk to a lot of people who watch streams and then don't buy the game. Even if they like the game, they somehow feel they've had an experience of it. But absolutely, this marketing and PR thing is an important component. And in fact, Twitch is rolling out a new function where on the bottom of a broadcast, you'll be able to click, and because they're now owned by Amazon, buy the game that you're watching. Now that's all well and good, but I'm enough of a critical cultural pessimist <laughs> to want to keep these regulatory structures on our radar. Being able to say things that critique games and maybe piss off developers is crucial. Ultimately, marketing and PR is an insufficient model for the creative production of live streamers and a richer understanding of culture more broadly. Live streamers, I think, often get this, despite the precarity their current position puts them in. So this is one who said, what is it that keeps people watching my cast? Is it me as a person, or is it just that I'm playing the games that they want to see? I definitely think it's a mixture of both. I think that co-creative model is there. I really do believe you can watch two different people broadcast the same game and have totally different experiences and totally different stories. The arguments live streamers regularly make about their productions at least behind the scenes. And I will really say there is a front stage and a backstage to live streaming right now because of that precarity. Those arguments represent a powerful form of what we often can think of as vernacular legal frameworks, ones which at their heart present a much more expansive rendering of creative action and production with commercial products. If you're interested in this notion of vernacular law and how content creators may hold ideas about creation and kind of artistic production that don't line up with the law, I would point you to Jessica Silby's fantastic book called The Eureka Myth, where she went out and interviewed all kinds of people who are creating IP, artists, by all, you know, all, all kinds of folks. And what she found over and over again is that the way the law conceptualizes intellectual property does not at all match how actual creative practitioners conceptualize inter intellectual property. So I think live streamers highlight a deeply co-creative model of culture, one that echoes Coombe's understanding that the, quote, use of commercial media to make meaning is often a constitutive and transformative activity, not merely a referential or descriptive one. The desire of many live streamers to profit from their work, to live within what are admittedly turbulent commercial systems built on platforms they don't own has to be better reckoned with critically. It can't be written off as simply co-opted fandom or exploitation. And I think this exploitation model is really insufficient for understanding the kind of labor folks are doing on these platforms. Nor simply tolerated monetization at the discretion of real IP holders. It shouldn't be that you can produce something and a dev can come in and say, take it down. It is actually ours. The activities of players, which might otherwise be stood as simply enacting the game as given, is in fact a form of productive creative engagement and transformative work warranting much more cultural recognition and legal protection than it's currently afforded. We might also want to think about linking up our inquiries into live streaming to even broader issues about the nature of play in digital environments. Over many years of game studies now, we've seen people articulate much more sophisticated models of computation and creative human action, a kind of circuit uh, between machines, humans, and others that most law and social theory currently captures. This is a much more nuanced co-creative model with machines, with games of art as artifacts, with developers. 
It's a model of play as, I think, performance and transformative performance and play as cultural work. And I believe if we turn back to this fundamental that play is at its heart transformative, we might not want to cede the ground so quickly. If we want to take live streaming seriously as a medium, if we want to have richer understandings of the work of play, we need something more than models rooted in marketing or PR. We have to start thinking about the way live streaming is a new form of media that exceeds the bounds of game artifacts, of narrow IP formulations, and stands as, or at least has the potential to, a critical cultural space. And while I, they, the live streamers, wouldn't make the link themselves, I want to suggest that the transformative work live streamers do is part of a much longer critical conversation about media ownership and creation. Live streamers are, in a very real sense, following the old DIY call, don't just watch TV, make it. It's a little fuzzy sign there. Those of you who know 80s history will remember there were really important interventions in media production and distribution then. The provocative twist is that they may not have the explicit political orientation, though I'd say their actions are deeply political, and may even want the space, may even want to profit from their work in the space. But ultimately, they are pushing new, entirely new forms of networked broadcast and participation in digital culture. They are, through their practices, participati participating in a much longer and important conversation about access to media production and distribution as part of a democratic society. Thanks. to TL for that wonderful talk. Um, we also want to say thank you to those of you on Twitter who pointed out that we missed a content warning for the talk. Oh, so I'm sorry. Thank you very much. We really uh, appreciate it because we always are trying to make this a more inclusive space. My apologies. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about that later or we can talk about it in the Q&A. We have about 30 minutes for questions. Who would like to ask the first question? Hi. Okay. Yeah. Uh, first, thank you for your talk. Thanks. And uh, my question involves uh, one of my favorite Twitch things, which is Twitch plays Pokemon. And I wanted to know if that had any influence in your research. Yeah. And if it did, did it have to do with the way that everyone was playing, therefore who owns it? Yeah. And sort of the meme culture that it embodied yeah. and that came out of it. Yeah. So I'd like to hear about that. Yeah. I loved that moment, actually. So Twitch plays Pokemon was probably the moment where my colleagues who had no idea about games or like live stream were like, oh, there's this thing. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> it's a cool thing. Uh, I think it's a great example of both the power of multi-sidedness. So the fan culture, not just fan culture, but the way kind of the production of play got handled on other sites as well, sort of strategies, knowledge bases. Uh, and as you say, the collective performance of play. Uh, I think it's a great example of kind of upending you know, there's a long, there's an unfortunate but understandable history in game studies for like, who's holding the controller, right? Who's the singular person driving the play? And I think Twitch plays Pokemon and many other things kind of push at that and say like, what are, are there other ways in which we can talk about play as a distributed or collective experience? So um, I thought it was a pretty, and seeing it evolve. And also, I also think it's a great example of the interrelation between culture and technology. Because as Twitch played Pokemon went on, the developer, the person doing the stream, iterated on inputs and iterated on sort of how people could play. So you remember it went from, in the beginning, just like the flood of characters to having democracy, anarchy. There was this kind of circuit between practice and the technology itself, which for me is always a constant thread um, at work. Yeah. More questions? So my question is actually about the like physical controllers for like like a DualShock 4 for the PlayStation where okay. you have like a share button on the yeah. controller itself. Yeah. 
Like, would you say that actually having that there is actively encouraging someone to create a social experience? Yeah. Or is it just something where they're trying to make a concession to like people who would otherwise see the game as lack, like the system as lacking? Yeah, yeah. I love that you bring that up because when I started this project, I was actually doing a, a little fellowship at uh, Microsoft Research. And so I had an opportunity to be out in Redmond at times where the new Xbox was being developed and could see them working through that process of adding those buttons to both of the consoles. Um, so I mean, a few things strike me as interesting. It's of course a way for the console makers and games that are gonna be on that platform to tap into the power of live streaming. But as much as anything, I found the regulation of that ability fascinating. So for example, when the PlayStation uh, launched and there was the, the live button, people were in the playroom and pretty much using, the, the fascinating thing was people who had consoles were able to, to do webcam streaming that they hadn't before because they now had the affordable equipment. And it was really interesting to see Twitch very qu quickly come in and start regulate and put prohibitions on what could be shown. And in fact, the playroom as a kind of open space where there was some game stuff happening, but it was also just an open cam quickly got shut down. So, I mean, I think one of the tricky things about the console integration is that a lot of the folks who are doing what I think of as very high-end streaming are doing a lot of graphical overlays and bots and notification systems. And sometimes that becomes much more complex on the consoles. But it's a great, it's a great example of, you know, even live streaming on Twitch is not one single thing, right? The, the platforms, the materialities really shape what people are able to do. Hi. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so I was really interested in the connection you made to Paper Tiger. <laughs> yeah. Do you buy it? Well, because you tell I kind of do. Okay. And YouTube, well, YouTube went to them went at the very, very beginning and approached mm -hmm. them because they had figured out like, streaming before, like, as interesting was coming up. And they totally rejected it because they were keeping their, like, anti-capitalist, we're not going to engage with advertisers, and they didn't trust the people at YouTube to kind of force well. that. Yeah. So I guess I was curious because they've, like historically now, what they are, they still exist. Yeah. Uh, and it's such an important place of activism and journalists, but the way people have made money and careers in relation to that. Yeah. I, I don't know, it made me want to kind yeah. of ask you to do some imagining or ask if yeah. there are communities on Twitch that are kind of following in that yeah. vein of activism yeah. and journalism and arts practice. Thank you for the historical tip. I did not know they approached them. That's fascinating. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the use of live streams for political activism engagement is huge. Um, you know, there were Occupy streams that were regularly up. Uh, as we've seen, people have now continued to use uh, the way live streaming is getting integrated into Facebook as a way to chronicle stuff. So, yeah, there's a in, in one of the chapters, I kind of try to situate Twitch and game live streaming as part of a much broader conversation about how live streaming is getting used for media production and distribution in ways that are very decentralized. It's decentralized with a caveat that there are still platforms that are driving it. Uh, we had a student at MIT, it was a year or two ago, named Gordon Magnum, who did his master's thesis with the uh, Center for Civic Media on live streams and thinking about ways to also annotate live streams so that, that they become not simply just like, here is content piping out, but here are resources and waypoints and things you can do to help or participate in the content you're getting. So yeah, that's, thank you. Uh, so, I'm trying to remember how old this mic. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk about the, the, any priorities you've observed with the way that different types or um, approaches of streamers deploy their resources? <coughs> because I'm thinking in terms of um, Twitch chat, yeah. Which is, yeah. like, I'm surprised the room didn't groan the second I said that because it's yeah. just kind of a foregone conclusion now that <coughs> if you, especially if you're a marginalized person of any kind, yeah. you go to watch the stream and you immediately close the chat yeah. because why would you have it running? It's just a nonstop stream of whatever. Yeah. Um, and thinking very particularly about, and I'm going to bring my own words. Yeah, no, please. Um, of the fighting in community yep. trying to, like, manage this, this tension between we want to be a successful... <coughs> competitive gaming yeah. thing and we want to stay 
rowdy and kind of impromptu yeah. and informal. And I feel like, do you have some streamers who are willing to devote like the resource? I'm thinking of stream friends, for yeah. example, yeah, and absolutely. stream esteem, like people who've specifically got resources devoted to moderating and protecting chat above and beyond yeah. expending their resources on better tech for better streams. Yeah. And I'm guessing that some people put a priority on that and some don't, and I'm wondering if you saw patterns. Yeah, it's absolutely right. Some, some do and some don't. Same with esports companies. Some pay attention and some don't. So in the book, I spend a lot of time talking about moderation and chat. And uh, the work I do with AnyKey uh, we're really committed to the idea that like hide the chat is a completely insufficient and bullshit solution. <laughs> like chat is important. It is salvageable. It is actually like it's with a lot of, you see this with a lot of companies in general. They sort of want to have social, but they don't do the work to make social viable. And so one of the things we are really pushing for and we've done a white paper on chat. I write about it in the book is thinking about what is what is the what does moderation work look like? So chat is funny because there's actually a way in which chat can get regulated for good and it can also get used for evil as we've seen. And so uh, yeah, I spend a lot of time looking at the kinds of work um, pro productive, positive streamers do. And I will tell you that good li if you've ever been in like a good live stream where like the vibe is good there is usually a whole crew of moderators sitting in a Skype channel somewhere uh, doing lots of work to make that happen. I did a, if you're interested, I did a blog post right up at anykey.org, that's this other organization I work with, at TwitchCon this year because they had a number of panels with really great streamers talking about what it takes to have good moderation and it's work. It is, it is actually, it is absolutely a place where you can decide where you're gonna spend your resources. Um, yeah, I, I really want to see much more accountability, especially too on the side of esports companies. Um, you know, if I go to a ball game, I actually usually feel pretty safe. I can, you know, some places let you text if you're having trouble, so you don't even have to find a security agent. The amount of cluelessness and disregard esports companies have for their chat is appalling. So, yeah, we really, it's a, it, thank you for asking it, because it's a huge issue and huge problem. So Todd's question actually kind of dovetails yeah. with what I was thinking about. Yeah. Um, but very quickly, I moderate my channel very heavily. Yeah. And there's a lot of tools that can help you with that. Yeah. Um, so we can talk more. Yeah. But I was wondering if you looked at the intersection of race and gender, who uses a camera, who doesn't. Yeah. And also the kinds of interactions you have in your chat, because a lot of in a lot of your own examples, the chat itself was really toxic, mm. even though, you know, from a screenshot, it's hard to tell how the caster dealt yeah. with it. Yeah. But there is a, a very broad gap yeah. of how people treat you when you are on camera in a person of color or if yep. you are out on your stream versus if you're on console and maybe don't yeah. have a camera. So how did that, yeah. those variables inter yeah. interact? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, there was a fantastic, I'll do a plug for another a panel that happened at TwitchCon this year. Um, it was called Diversify Twitch, and it was by uh, a number of uh, streamers, people of color who are streamers, tackling that question head on. And in my conversation with folks, uh, it's kind of a, it's a, what do I want to say? It's like devastating, because usually they're going through the calculations of how much pain they're willing to endure to pursue this thing. So there's a really common uh, trope of I just need to grow a thicker skin or I just grew a thicker skin um, and then the point at which like that be that's not a viable solution and the drop-off happens so in fact one of the select not selection one of the problems when you're doing stuff on professionalization is the folks who may not have made it up because the calculations and the choices were like I'm not gonna do this anymore um, I've also interviewed people, I, I, um, I don't want to, I always anonymize my, I've interviewed people who do a lot of work supporting each other in streams. So the idea of like, we are going to, and it kind of references back to something you mentioned, Todd, we're going to build a community that works hard to support each other uh, in the face of this onslaught of shit. So it's a really great point. And the choice to, it's not, it's be, have a camera, use a mic, speak, like all of these things become factors that Anybody who is vulnerable on that platform makes thoughtful, serious calculations about what they're going to do. It's not a, 
they are very aware of the choices being made along the way. And absolutely, you're absolutely right. There's tons. One of the things that's most impressive about the moderation side, and it's something I spend time talking about, is is this relation between technology and human moderation. There's a number of bots. Twitch has now even implemented an auto mod system. So again, it's important to understand that this circuit between human and non-human actors to produce community management moderation is a really important one. So thank you, and I just want to pick at something you said here at the yeah. end, yeah. Uh, where you know you, you had the don't don't just watch TV and make it. Yeah. And I think on one hand that's like an extremely empowering thing, like mm -hmm. you can go and play these games and stream and get yeah. out to people. And on the other hand, I think it runs the risk of getting close to that. Um, you know, well, if you don't like what's in games, go yeah. Games that's a good point. Removing the accountability for yeah. the current content creators, and so I was just yeah. wondering if you thought about. Um, I know, like you're like politicizing that point yeah, because yeah. the streamers aren't necessarily no, doing it, but it's a great point. Uh, and the you know the market model that's long been a rebut. That's long been a thing people have said all the way back to MMOs. If you don't like this MMO, if it's a crappy culture, just go to another. So I completely agree. That's a that is a completely insufficient model. So yeah, it's a good point. And again. Thank you for pointing out too, because I think uh, I was trying to twist it politically, but being able to not just watch TV but make it has a lot of things scaffolded into it. Everything from, as I signaled, technicity to resources to materialities to subject positions. So thanks for that pushback, because I want to politicize it, but with the recognition that this is not a meaning, this is not a trivial move to make. So thanks. So I was wondering, um, uh, according to my understanding, very oftentimes uh, transformative culture is theorized as and described as being sort of feminine coded work, mm. and uh, many times the work of women. Mm. But uh, it seems to me, as a not very informed outsider, mm -hmm. that a lot of the uh, streamers that, as you say, you know, mm. professionalize their mm. activities and gain popularity are uh, men, and mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you have any comments about that, with me fully understanding that I may not have yeah, no. the appropriate background. No, no, I I had thought about the the, fe the feminine, con I, I'm not quite sure how to handle that one. There is, I think, a, a, a real practical problem right now of who is actually able to succeed on the platform. <laughs> in a non-diverse, there's a non-diversified cast of characters. And that is tied to everything choices from choices Twitch makes about who gets in the front rotating panel to some of the things I described. Um, so that's a real issue. I don't, I don't know that I would code transformative work as feminine. <laughs> that's very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> But I will say this, one of the things, um, and it's probably not as clear in this work, but I try to do it more, especially my work in MMOs, is I do think it's sometimes too easy to think of transformative work as software work or tech work and not social process work. So the work, for example, back in MMO days, that people did to self-organize in ways that were completely outside of the frame of the game is important transformative work even though it didn't produce a bit of code. So like modding is often seen as like the epitome of transformative work. And I think it's really important to think about process in the case of streamers, affective labor, communication. There are all these other things that don't get kind of distilled to an artifact but are just as powerful. I have no idea if that got at your question at all. I'm sorry. No, that definitely okay. helps. Okay, okay. <laughs> we can talk more. Thank you. Um, I was actually at TwitchCon, by the way. This oh, year. nice. Oh. Um, Paul, and I, I thought those diversity panels were, were well intentioned, but very awkward. Um, yeah. I was at the <laughs> one with ammunition and distracted elf, and, yeah. um, and it was just it was very strange to me that ammunition didn't really want to own yeah. her uh, lesbianism, and, yeah. and it seemed like a product of the community that she was trying to create. But, yeah. Um, but my actual question is actually about how uh, Twitch seems to be colonizing college campuses. And mm -hmm. this is because um, at my university, um, 
they offered the student gaming group a Twitch verified channel. Uh, it's about yeah. 700 people, and right. they got so excited. Yeah. And the requirement is they have to stream at least nine hours a week. Yep. Um, and they were so excited, it seemed like a gift, yeah. and it didn't, to me, I was really wondering if it was a Trojan horse, and yeah. what my responsibilities were, <laughs> as yeah. the person sort of offering my equipment for the streaming, so yeah, I'd I, love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great point. So it's hard because I don't want to, I, I feel like a, a lot of the stuff around Twitch, UGC, it can very easily get into like a, an overly simplistic exploitation argument, and I don't want to make that. At the same time, there are, I think, really, Prob increasingly problematic expectations and practices that are framed because of an advertising model, a revenue model, a sponsorship model. And that extends from, as you're saying, uh, a, a college group, all the way up to now esports players who in their contracts are required to stream. So these are people for whom it, it, you could imagine be like a traditional athlete being expected to be on camera five hours a day six days a week, five, I mean like, so there are true issues around kind of the structure and economics of it that are profound. And I, I'm disheartened by the increasing ways, you know, the kind of buy now button, I think is a really problematic example of that turn. Um, it's hard, I, I do want to say one other thing, I think you're absolutely right about those panels, they were complicated. My challenge as an ethnographer is trying to, I don't do, I still make normative judgments, but my challenge is also trying to f like let people give me their meanings and understandings of their work and give it care and respect. And I agree, it's one of the strategies for a lot of the folks who are in that space now is, is wanting to be there as a gamer, um, but the kind of complexities and nuance around other identities that impinge on it. So I've, I've, it's funny because I've just finished writing a section on this in the book, and when it comes out, I'd love to hear if you think I try to capture it. It's a, it's a hard thing to capture because I don't, I don't want to criticize or undermine that position, um, but it does pose real challenges to other folks who are on the space and watching them. Yeah, so my read on the, the panels was the same as yours. I have a question about um, the content in the games and yeah. whether or not um, developers are kind of taking note of the way that the streamers are um, interfacing it with it. And I'm thinking specifically of games that are coming out that actually have been kind of designed with the expectation that people in the community are actually going to be playing with the streamer. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you've seen examples specifically too of games that have been designed to provoke the community and the streamer into addressing um, maybe topics that yeah. ordinarily yeah. Not yeah, so I think the range of ways developers right now are dealing with the Twitch stuff is there's everything from them identifying key influencers and making sure they're seeded into beta programs and launch programs and hyping up. And so if you <clears throat> were around and watching before Hearthstone launched. I think it was a great example of like a lot of people were kind of doing a lot of uh, influencer work around that. The other is developers who are thinking about how to, that are just knowing that one of their imagined uses of their games will be that they'll be live streamed. And whether that means having SDKs that communicate with Twitch or thinking about it that way, that's one. Then there's this other category of game developers who are now building games for live streaming. There are several out there. Oh wait, there's a, there, I'll do one. There's a several out there where they imagine it as kind of like a, what they call sometimes Sunday fun day games. So these are games where the broadcaster gets to play with their audience. And it's, that's what it's like, that is its envisioned use. The other category too is somebody like, uh, if those of you who follow Rami Ismail's work, where using the platform as a way to kind of both chronicle and bring people into the development process, and so it's getting it's getting used in a in a few different ways. There was a second part to your question, though. I think I've sidestepped. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> okay. I, don't know. I think I was just curious too. Like, uh, I think of games like Life is Strange or games that yeah. have these like um, choice moments, and whether yeah. or not you're seeing our developers seeing those oh. with uh, <clears throat> is it influencing the, the more the writing of it? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know. I don't have insight to that. If anybody does, I would love to hear. Um, there's one game, Seraph, that actually has Twitch integration, and you yeah. do hashtags, you decide whether the streamer is penalized. Yeah. It's a bonus. Okay. So that's, yeah, leveraging the interaction thing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, TL. That was really wonderful. Um, I'm really fascinated by this idea of transformative work. And as someone who does uh, work more from a theory and cultural studies perspective, yeah. I wonder if you see ways that we can extend that idea out beyond the ethnographic and the legal context mm. and into um, the kind of play that maybe doesn't happen in these public spaces but happens at home, happens um, one on one. Uh, can yeah. you think about this more conceptually as well? Yeah, absolutely. So I would defer to you on this, but I feel like the argument I'm making about transformative work, it is, we've understood audiences don't take up text as given for a very long time. Uh, I mean, I'm putting a slightly different spin on it with this language in highlighting process, but uh, it feels to me like it's part and parcel of a much longer conversation about media, media practices, in home, out home. So I don't, I mean, I would, I think your disciplinary background, I would defer to it, but I, I suspect I'm not sh on the one hand, sometimes I think using this language makes it more provocative than it actually is. This is culture. Transformative work is the work of culture. <laughs> it's just what we do. It's, it's how cul culture operates. So I don't know what you think. Does, I, I, I mean, I love it. I want to take that idea <laughs> and I want to use it for lots of things. And yeah. I think it's, it's widely applicable for queerness <coughs> as well and for yeah. what I, I think a lot of us think of as queer play. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so thank you. It's really helpful to have that different disciplinary perspective. Yeah, so. yeah. We have time for like one or two more questions. Can we? Hello. Um, is this working? Um, yeah. So one question that I have uh, in responding to the rise of streaming as a way of sharing gaming experiences mm -hmm. is. Uh, this lovely way it has of uh, creating permeability to the boundaries that were mm. once more rigid. Mm. Um, and I think that's particularly interesting for me as a creator in the way it makes development processes um, much more transparent and open to fans. Yeah. Uh, and I'd be curious to hear what you have to say about um, development streams and the sort of interchangeability of those and yeah. um, really oriented streams. Yeah. A lot of development can switch back and forth between the two. Yeah, I, that's a thank you. That's a I'd, of course, love to hear how, you, I don't know if you're using it yourself. I'm not really Okay, yeah. Uh, one of the things I, so if, you, if you're if you on Twitch, you probably have seen that, okay, so there's development streams, but they've also had this whole new category, and that's not new anymore, but called creative, where people are, yeah, creative is great. Uh, you, can just, you can go, people watch making their cosplay costumes. You can go see them creating art. And I think for me, it fits so perfectly. When it was launched, some people were like, it's not gaming. But to me, it taps into the pleasure of watching process and kind of the, the aesthetics and beauty and, and as you say, this kind of flow back and forth of process. So, um, you know, Twitch keeps pushing, pushing the edge of what they allow on the platform. You know, there's now social eating. There's even IRL, which is a way point back to Justin TV, the roots of Twitch. But creative for me, it, it somehow gets it, I think, what you're describing. And it, it makes perfect sense, and those are hugely popular too. I mean, it, I don't know too. I don't know if, you, to me, one of the things I do like about the range of streams is, you know, there are streams you put on to laugh and be entertained, and then there are these almost kind of ambient streams. And I think sometimes watching people tinker and put together a costume or do some, it's a kind of lovely ambience. One of the ideas I have in the book is of ambient sociality. A lot of people I talk to leave Twitch on all day like probably some of us used to do with the TV, yeah. And it's just, it's there as a presence, and some of those streams have a lovely flow to them, so. I don't know if that gets at that, but I, I think you're on to something. Yeah. It's about time for us to wrap up right now. Um, does anyone have like one last quick comment? Thank you all so much Thank you all, thanks. Let's have a big thanks. hand for two and for all of you who are participating on Twitter, and for everyone who asked the question, and everyone watching us on Twitch, 
<laughs> Our talk about Twitch streaming, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs>